You're on mute, Gray. All right, I think we can get started rolling some slides and do our introduction. Hopefully we get a few more folks joining us today. Um, Russ, if you'll take us to the next slide, please. All right, so today 3C Ren is offering this course on what energy consultants need to know about quality insulation installation with Russ King from Coded Energy. Next slide. So today as we're going through, uh, please feel free to put any questions or engagement in the chat and I will flag it for Russ or Russ will respond as he's able. Uh, we do ask that folks stay muted, but if you are comfortable raising your hand and asking off of mute, we're happy to accommodate that as well. Just a little bit about 3C Ren for anyone who might not be familiar, but we are a partnership of San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties, and we use ratepayer funds to reinvest in communities that have traditionally missed out on IOU funding and programming, specifically in terms of programs for building professionals and households. We offer three programs. The program that you are benefiting from today is Energy Code Connect. We offer services for code professionals, including our Energy Code Coach. Uh, and then we also have our Building Performance Training, which is a workforce education program, and Home Energy Savings, which offers incentives and education to homeowners looking to upgrade to more energy efficient homes. Um, you can probably just skip through these slides, Russ. Uh, I think I did a decent overview there. Um, and I think after these, I hand it back to you. All right. Thanks, all. Take it away, Russ. Awesome. Thanks, Gray. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Russ King. I've uh, been a trainer for 3 CUN for a while. I teach a lot of classes on energy codes and HVAC design and all that good stuff. Uh, my company is Coded Energy. Um, we're a consulting firm and we're developing a, a 3D software for um, load calcs and HVAC design. Uh, this class is uh, a class that I put together for a KBEC conference a couple of years ago and uh, it got really good feedback. And uh, so it's always good to, uh, to dust it off and, and put it out there. Um, one of the things that um, uh, about QII is, uh, especially on the installer side, is there's a lot of turnover. So there's a constant need for uh, training on QII. Uh, Cowsers does a very good job with their um, QII handbook, and we'll, we'll go through some of the pages on that. Um, that's probably the best resource out there. But this class is geared towards energy consultants. Um, one of the, the most important things I think energy consultants need to realize about QII is it, in the software, it's just this harmless little checkbox. You just literally, you just put a check in a box and you need to realize what happens after that. You need to realize that it puts a lot of things into motion. It causes a lot of people to do a lot of things. And if they're not done correctly, it causes a lot of headaches and those headaches can come back and bother you if it's not, um, if it's not done correctly. So, um, so there's definitely a theme here. The theme is going to be coordination and communication, okay? So let's dive into it. So uh, it is a lot harder to make a house comply with the code than ever before. The energy code is about as strict as it's gonna get. Uh, it can get a little bit stricter, but not much. Um, and the problem with that is, um, well, it's gonna require a lot more measures um, that are very dependent on how well they're installed. And when something is, depending on how well it's installed, it generally becomes a HERS measure, which means someone special has to go out, a special inspector has to go out and inspect it. And QII is definitely a HERS measure. Um, uh, there's a lot more HERS measures uh, being specified than ever before. Um, and the one thing about QII that's different than most is it requires multiple visits by the HERS rater. So it, it is pretty involved. Um, and one of the big problems is if it fails, it used to be able, you could just go back and remodel the house and take QII off and say, oh, wait, well, we just won't take that credit. Well, you can't do that anymore. It's just too big of a credit. It's too hard to replace it, especially that far into a project. So it's that much more important that it be done correctly, um, along the way. Um, 
let's see, back in the day when QII first started, um, it was sort of an extra credit. It was something that you could say, oh, that's, I, you know, I've got a lot of glass in my house or it's in a weird orientation. I'm having a little trouble making the house comply. I'm going to go for this extra credit called QII. And it gave you some extra compliance. And, um, and then, you know, people would go out and try to do it. They go, oh, shoot, it's not passing. Let's, well, let's just take that off and put something else on, maybe add insulation to the ceiling. And you could model it away. Um, that is much more difficult to do these days. Um, the good news is that we've been doing QII for a while, and most HERS raters are, have gotten good at it. Uh, they understand the importance of communication and coordination. And um, um, insulating companies have gotten somewhat used to it. Um, there's very few insulation companies out there that have not had to deal with it at some point. Um, and so it's not as new as it used to be. I, I used to, when it first came out, I used to get calls almost on a daily basis, at, at least two or three a week um, from HERS raters going, oh, I just went out to this project to inspect for QII and they sheetrocked over everything. What do I do? And the answer was you fail it. They, if you can't see the insulation, it's a fail. You cannot inspect it. And so that was, you know, then their choice was to either rip off all the sheetrock, which they're never going to do, or um, remodel the house, which worked back then, but that doesn't work today. You can't do that today. So coordinate, you don't want that to happen. Most builders, most HERS raters, most insulation companies now know, do not sheetrock over that insulation until the HERS raider has, has seen it and passed it, okay? So it's very, very important. Um, so that in the software that you check, it's very important that you understand what that's putting into motion. And I, I the analogy I use is like you're standing on top of a snow covered mountain, looking down at this beautiful valley and down in the middle of the valley, there's this little Swedish town down there, a little picturesque town, and you're going to roll a snowball down this hill. And if you don't know exactly where that snowball is going and exactly how big that snowball is going to get by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, you're going to take out an entire village of, of people. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing that how, what checking this one little box uh, causes things to, to, to go into motion. Energy consultants need to communicate the potential costs and the requirements of all measures, all HERS measures that they specify, not just QII. QII is probably one of the most complicated, certainly the one that fails the most, um, but any HERS measure, any HERS measure that you check, if you, things like, um, um, Oh, the uh, plumbing, some of the plumbing measures, you know, piping insulation, compact distribution, things like that. You need to know what's required for those to pass. There are certain houses where you can check the box and get the credit for it. And then it turns out it's just impossible to put in the house. OK, so you need to communicate um, the cost requirements for all measures that you specify when you specify a HERS measure. It's very it's a very, very good idea that you go into the reference appendices, it's the Energy Commission publication, RA reference appendices, um, also known as the protocols. HERS raters call those the protocols because that's the step-by-step -step instructions that they have to follow in order to inspect and pass something. Um, if you go into the reference appendix and you look for table RA2-1, it'll list all the HERS measures and which sections of the reference appendices apply to each one of those HERS measures and then just, just cut and paste that into a, a document and send that to your client, whoever your client is. If it's the architect, if it's the builder uh, whoever, or the homeowner, whoever your client is, let them know that, hey, I specified these HERS measures and I'm attaching the protocols that the HERS rater is going to follow when they go out and inspect it. That's Think of that as the answers to the test, okay? They're going to they're gonna give you a test and, and they're going to give the installers a test and you've just given them the answers. That's that's the way to do it, okay? So the inspection protocols can be used as the installation guides, all right? Same as the forms. The, the, the CF2R and CF3R forms can also be used as checklists, all right? So uh, what exactly is QII? Well, it's a protocol for the verification of properly installed insulation. It is not a protocol for installing insulation. It, it's a protocol for inspecting it. It's based on industry standards. It was it was basically plagiarized, cut and pasted right out of the, the standards from NEMA and ICAA. That's the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association and the Insulation Contractors Association of America. Those are the manufacturers and the installers, their association. They had protocols 
for putting this stuff in. And that's where these that's where the QAI rules come from. OK, very, very similar. There's been some tweaks to them uh, for California purposes and for code compliant purposes. But that's kind of not been around the ICAA. ICAA um, what was it called? It was a um, uh, a tech bulletin or something like that uh, was printed in 1975 that where a lot of the rules come from. So this is not new stuff. This has been around for a long time. It just hasn't been enforced very well until QII went into effect, okay? So it's how the manufacturers want their insulation to be installed. If you're manufacturing insulation and you want it to work, you want it to be installed a certain way. And, and that's, that's where a lot of the protocols come from. So the actual inspection has been delegated to third-party special inspectors, which we know as HERS raters, okay? Um, the protocols are all in a reference appendix section called RA 3.5, big, long section. Um, it can also be used as guidelines for properly installing the insulation. So if you know what someone's going to come out and inspect for, and you, and you install it in such a way that that inspection will pass, it's now it becomes an installation protocol as well. Okay, So that's a good use for it. So what should you know about QII? Well, it's a, now a prescriptive measure. Like I said, it used to be an extra credit. It used to be something you could do on top of all the other stuff, but now it's a prescriptive measure. And what that means is it's on the house that you're being compared to. So when you run the computer simulation, you've got your, proto, your, um, sorry, your um, uh, proposed house and you've got your standard house. The proposed house is the way you wanna build your house. The standard house is the house that has all the prescriptive measures on it. The software does a simulation of both of those and compares them. As long as the proposed house uses the same or less energy as the standard house, plus some other EDR stuff, uh, but in, in, in theory, the way it works is as long as the proposed house uses the same or less energy than the standard house, you pass, okay? The standard house has QII on it, all right? So it's very efficient insulation on that house. And if you, if you do QII on the proposed house, they're equal. If you choose not to do QII on the proposed house, you've just dug a big hole that has to be dug out of, uh, gotten out of in a different way using other measures. Very difficult to do these days, very difficult to do. So QII pretty much is gonna be on the vast majority of new homes, unless for some strange reason you can get out of it, okay? If it's a really, really mild climate, the house doesn't have a lot of glass and stuff like that. You might be able to get away with modeling without QII. But uh, like I said, it's very common these days. And so um, it's not as big of a deal as it used to be, uh, as long as there's communication and coordination that happens. OK, um, so um, a good resource, um, Gina Rada and I teach a class for Energy Code A's. Um, it's if you go to energycodeace.com and search for decoding QII, there's a pre-recorded pre class there where we um, we talk a lot about what architects need to know. We talk about a lot about what builders need to know. So it's a more broader class in terms of the target audience than this one. It also has a really really good handout with a lot of good information in it, uh, including the CalCERT's QII handbook. Okay, but you can download that separately, and I'll give you some information on that here in a second. All right, so QII, why the fuss? All right, there was a large study done back in 2005, okay? Prior to the 2005 energy code. And basically what they did is they looked at a whole bunch of houses. They looked at all these houses, new houses, recently built houses, houses under construction and stuff like that. Um, and what they found was in every single house they looked at, the insulation was installed poorly. There was some serious defect in the insulation, every single house, every single house. So they basically said, all right, well, that's industry standard. That's just how people do it. So we're going to automatically derate the insulation in the software that models the energy use. Okay. We're just going to, that's just, if that's just how they're going to be, we're just going to penalize them automatically. All right. And it derates the insulation by about 13.5%. Okay. Uh, that, that might be an old number, but um, it's, it's significant. It's significant. So it's, it's essentially guilty until proven innocent is, is the theory here. All right. They just assume that they're going to do a bad job. All right. But if you check the QII box, that penalty goes away. They say, all right, you're going to have your installation inspected 
Therefore, we trust that you're going to do a good job on the insulation. We will take away that penalty. Okay. So the energy consultant selects QII, HERS verification is triggered, and that shows up on the CF1R. All right. So that's kind of the process. If it is not planned for from the very beginning, there's going to be a lot of problems. All right. Coordination is key. Education of installers is extremely important because, as I mentioned, there's a lot of turnover. The in insulation installers is probably one of the least popular jobs next to the next to the poor person emptying the porta potties um, out on a job site. All right, it's not a pleasant job. I did it one summer. It's horrible. It's terrible work. And insulation installers um, are always looking for another another job on the on the job site that's not quite as bad. Okay, um, so <clears throat> so there's a lot of turnovers. The point I'm getting at: insulation installers don't last very long. Now, the if they're if you've got a good insulation company, they're going to have a good supervisor. They're going to have a good manager who's out there watching the installers and is going to tell them what to do. But it's it's very important that we constantly constantly train these people, or the new person is going to come in and just start cramming the insulation in like they like they used to. Okay. So education is very important. Um, HERS raters inspect the insulation, but everyone, everyone on the job site, every trade you can possibly think of is going to help make it pass. Even the electrician has something to do with QII. Okay, and I'll show you. I'll show you how that works. So, one of the most important things to do when you're early on in a project, and this is something we emphasize with architects. Um, is to define the thermal boundary. Now, in a simple one-story slab on grade house, that's pretty simple. Okay, you've got this. It's it's basically defining the excuse me, defining the separation points between conditioned space and unconditioned space. All right, in a vertical surface, um, there's generally going to be some thickness to that to that barrier. Okay, um, so you have to define it. Where it gets tricky is like in this diagram here, let's say that instead of having attic over the garage, there was a room over the garage. And then when it gets down into here, defining where the thermal boundary follows the floor and goes up the walls, that can get very tricky. Other things that come into play are things like um, tub and shower inserts, those big fiberglass inserts, they slide into place, okay? Um, that starts affecting the interior air barrier and things like that. So always look, and I'll show you some other examples too. Fireplaces, uh, are you defining the air barrier around the outside of the fireplace? Are you defining it along the interior wall? Things like that, okay? So defining the thermal boundaries is super important. It's always a good idea to take a set of plans and, and just and take a red marker and just draw exactly, like on the sections, draw exactly where the thermal boundary is going to be. And what you'll find is there's, there's some areas where you're gonna, you're gonna have to make some decisions and it's you've gotta make those decisions early on and put them in the details. What exactly is the air barrier, all right? Um, and then sealing of all potential leaks. It's amazing if you look up in your ceiling of your roof and you think about your house being pressurized, you're pressurizing your house um, uh, or, or let's, say, let's say your house has been dunked underwater and the air is gonna escape, where are the bubbles going to come up through the things. I see a fire, uh, uh, a smoke detector right there that's got a hole in the ceiling behind it. Um, I've got light fixtures, air is gonna go into the outlets, it's gonna go up through the walls and it's gonna escape through the walls. So this is a big one right here where it says A. And by the way, this is out of the Couchage QII handbook. Um, they, I just went to look for the link and they've actually changed their webpage. There used to be a, a resources button on the Couchage webpage, but if you just Google, CalCERT's 2022 QII handbook, it'll come up as a download, okay? Um, and this is all, all these diagrams are straight out of there. And uh, what you'll see is A is insulating between the top plate, which is the top two by four and the sheetrock. So what happens is, is this space inside here is pressurized and you've got a little outlet or a light switch in the wall that pressure from the air is gonna move through it and get into the stud bay. And then it's gonna go up the stud bay and believe it or not, it sneaks right through this crack right here where the sheetrock is attached to the top plate. 
air can move through there. It's it it doesn't take much for that sheetrock to not be tied up against there. And if all they're doing is screwing it on, there's actually there's you can see daylight through there sometimes. And so what they have to do is put a gasket or caulk or or sometimes they'll come in the attic before they blow the insulation and they'll spray a foam over the top of this of this joint right here. OK, so that's very important. That's something that has to be that has to be sealed. Another one is when you have variations in the ceiling, you've got a, some rooms with 10 foot ceilings and then some rooms with eight foot ceilings. Um, but most of the rooms are 10 foot. So where there's an eight foot ceiling, there's what we call a drop. All right, there's a drop ceiling. So they frame this ceiling lower than the rooms next to it. And that creates this, this, this canyon where if you were to blow in insulation, the insulation is gonna fall down inside here. Well, what you're supposed to do is put a hard cover across the top of it like this and then seal that hard cover on, okay? Again, this is about air leaks. So QII, even though it's talking about insulation, one of the most important parts of QII is the air barrier. Insulation doesn't work if air is passing through it, all right? QII is about making sure there's an air barrier and then that insulation goes up against that air barrier. Now, when we start talking about SPF, it's a little different. So we're primarily talking about fiberglass bats, blown in fiberglass, blown in cellulose and stuff like that. That's, that type of insulation does not stop air movement very well at all, except when you don't want it to, um, like on um, attic vents and stuff like that, but it, 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 it doesn't. And so if you, if you were to hang a, R30 bat in the middle of the room, and if you were to blow 100 degree air on one side, what temperature is the air gonna come out the other side of that R30 bat? It's gonna come out at 100 degrees. Insulation doesn't filter out the heat. Insulation does not stop convection, it stops conduction. And in order for it to stop conduction, it has to stop convection first, okay? so. We're going to emphasize there's going to be a lot of emphasis on leaks, air leaks and things like that. So you got drop ceilings. Now, if you were to seal right here, it wouldn't do any good because the air is just going to go around. it. All right. It's just going to go around and get up into this dropped area. So that's why you need a hard cover. The other nice thing about hard covers is if you were using blown in insulation, it actually reduces the surface area of the insulated surface. OK, so it makes a nice flat Ideally, you want your ceiling, when you get up in your ceiling before they blow the insulation, you want it to be nice and flat with no, no drops and strange things like that. You want it to be nice and flat because that gives you a nice flat surface and it reduces the surface area of insulation. If you know the formula for conduction, it's U times A times delta T. A is a big number, okay? And it's the area of the surface. And, and instead of having just this surface here, if you had to insulate down here, across here and up here, that's a much bigger A, therefore your conduction is gonna be more, okay? So reducing the area that's, that has to be, um, uh, reducing your thermal boundary area can reduce conduction, all right? Any kind of pipes, vents, flue vents, chimneys, all kinds of stuff, they need some sort of, of air barrier, a fireproof air barrier. If this is a, um, if, this, if this vent gets hot, okay? There's special caulking they have to use and things like that. Um, Oh, right here, anytime you have double walls, if you have two walls touching each other to make the wall double thickness, you have to insulate in between those, like right here, okay? So it's all about preventing that air from getting up in the attic because there's pressure inside the house. Um, the pressure caused by um, 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 stratification, okay? Uh, warm air, warmer air rising and being less dense, it actually pushes up on the ceiling and it, creates a pressure differential and the air is gonna to wanna to escape. Uh, any kind of uh, masonry, chimneys, there needs to be um, some sort of uh, uh, hard cover spanning the, the gap between the wood and the masonry, and then it needs to be sealed, okay? So lots of places to seal. Whose job is that? Who, which trade does that? It's very important that you, you define responsibilities early in the project, okay? There's lots of penetrations through the top plate, okay? Uh, wires, plumbing, vents, knot holes, anything. They'll drill holes just for no apparent reason. Any kind of holes like that need to be sealed. So the herdsery is gonna walk through the house before it gets sheetrock and make sure all that stuff is sealed. 
the most common way to do that is with a, with an expandable foam, expanding foam that you just spray it down in there and it poofs out and 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 fills fills those gaps. Okay. Um, in the sheetrock itself, there's all kinds of penetrations. I mentioned there's a smoke detector, um, there's a light fixture, there's a, a ceiling fan over in the bathroom over there. Lots of penetrations in the sheetrock. Those all have to be sealed. Whose job is that? Whose job is it to do that? Which trade is going to caulk around the exhaust fan? Which trade is going to caulk around the electrical boxes? We got to know that stuff. We, the, the, they need to specify it because if you don't and the hers rater gets out there and goes, oh, this isn't sealed, it fails. And then people start saying, well, I thought you were going to do that. I thought you were going to do that. And they start pointing fingers at each other. So it's very important that this stuff gets specified early in the project. So energy consultants, this is this is advice I'm telling you so that you can tell the builders, okay? Tell your clients, the general contractors. Uh, fire sprinklers is a weird one. Um, early on, QII said fire sprinklers had to be sealed. Uh, and then it turned out they sealed some fire sprinklers in it. And the manufacturer's like, no, 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 you can't do that. Our fire sprinklers will not work if you seal around them. And so basically now with fire sprinklers, it's per manufacturer's instructions. Okay, so if a house needs fire sprinklers, um, there's a chance that the type of fire sprinklers they use require that air pass around it. That's how the, that's how it senses the heat is by air passing around it, which means leakage. And it's not a good it's not a good it's not a good idea for an energy efficient home if you use those types of fire sprinklers. So we encourage builders to to shop around for fire sprinklers that don't require air to pass around them. And so fire sprinklers have modified their designs somewhat, but the bottom line is for QII, do what the manufacturer says. You have to follow the manufacturer's specs. Um, some, some manufacturers say, uh, as, long as, as long as air can, can pass around it, you can also build a box over the top of it. But then that becomes very, very time consuming and expensive to do that. It's like a little sheetrock doghouse that goes over the top of the sprinkler on the top and that all has to be sealed. So very expensive thing to do. So definitely pay attention if fire sprinklers are required. Uh, register boots, the vast majority of times the HVAC contractor will seal around those. Sometimes they'll use a, um, um, what they call a butyl back tape or something like that or a foam or something like that. But usually the HVAC contractor will seal around their own register boots. Um, but who does the exhaust fan? Who does the electrical boxes? Maybe it's the electrician, maybe it's the sheet rocker, maybe it's the insulation contractor, who knows? But somebody, that needs to be in somebody's scope of work to do that. Um, all right, so one of the things about QII is if you, if you think about a vertical surface, okay, like a wall, you got a wall, you got a vertical surface, and because gravity goes down, um, stratification is a vertical phenomenon, all right? So warm air is going to want to displace cold air and they're going to want to switch places. So colder air is going to want to go to the bottom and warmer air is going to want to go to the top. Even inside a wall that happens. And if you've got a warm outside of the house, okay, and a cooler inside, as that cold air comes in contact with that warm surface, it warms up and it wants to rise. And then cooler air over here is going to want to fall. Well, if you give that air a place to do that, it will. And it's gonna, it'll, even if there's just a tiny gap between the inside air barrier, which is a sheetrock, and the insulation, it it'll it'll start that process. And then it just starts moving through, and you get these little thermal siphons happening inside the insulation inside the wall. Well, the best way to reduce that greatly, you can't stop it completely, but the best way to reduce that greatly is to not have a gap. And that's to have your, um, ins your air barrier in contact with your insulation on both sides, okay? So you'll hear, you'll hear us say no voids and no gaps is a big deal with QII. And that's why, it's because those gaps allow that air to start moving. And then once it starts moving, it starts, it starts reducing. And, and you can, in some cases, you actually see it with an infrared camera. Uh, where it's doing that, okay? So no voids, no gaps. That's the reason is because it allows these thermal siphons to happen. Um, the other thing is six-sided contact. So if you think about a stud bay, it's a, it's a big rectangle, okay? It's a big um, uh, 
six-sided surface, okay? It's three and a half inches by about 14 and a half across the top, and it's, you know, eight feet approximately tall and three and a half inches deep, okay? It's a six-sided surface, and when you put insulation in there, the insulation has to be in contact with all six sides. So you've got the top, which is the top plate. You've got the bottom, which is the bottom plate. You got the two sides, which are the studs on either side. And then you've got the front and the back. Okay. What was very, very common and it still is, is imagine, imagine hanging fiberglass bats in a framed house and it's windy. All right. And you're putting these, these, there's no fasteners. There's no glue. You're just taking these fiberglass bats and you're friction fitting them into these stud bays. And what they would do is they would take the, the bat with their thumbs and they would twist it and they would push it in to give it a little bit more friction to keep it from coming out. And then what happens is the front of that bat gets these big creases in them from their, I call them thumb, thumb creases because they're turning it in like that. Well, then when you put the sheetrock on the top of it, what happens is you get voids, okay? And voids will allow that insulation to go through. So they have to be very careful about that. And it's very difficult to do, especially in a windy area, to get those bats to stay in nicely uh, in time so that when the sheet rocker comes along and puts the sheet rock on top, you actually want that sheet rock to push down on the insulation and press it into place. In the back of this, the stud bay too, um, when, you, when you twist it like that, it leaves little voids in the corners because the insulation is not tucked back all the way in there. Okay, so this is something that, that um, HERS raters are, are, you know, will check for. Um, this is kind of a slice through a wall looking straight down on the wall. Okay, so here's your studs. Here's your exterior surface. And this would be the inside of the, of the house where the sheetrock would go on this side here. There's lots of things in those stud bays. If you walk through a house that's being framed and you look at every stud bay, there's gonna be something in there that's gonna make it difficult to, in, to install insulation. You, there's a lot of wires running left to right, horizontally through there. A lot of uh, Romex wire running through there. You got piping insulation, you got junction boxes, you got outlet boxes, you got all kinds of crazy stuff in there. You've got big structural metal fasteners and things like that. That all has to be worked around, okay? So when you have a metal pipe that comes up like this, um, you can cut the insulation and tuck it in on both sides so that it meets around that insulation. Um, if you have um, horizontal wires going through um, the insulation, it's, it's called delaminating it. So insulation is actually in layers. When they manufacture it, it's all a bunch of layers and you can grab it and split it in half and you tuck half behind the wire and half in front of the wires, okay? So there's a lot of things they have to do to make sure that you wanna minimize these little tiny gaps like this. It's impossible to get rid of all of them. It can never be perfect, but what typically happens is if you don't do a good job, uh, or, or if the lazy installers, what happens is they just stuff the insulation in over the top of the, the pipes and the wires, and then you get this big void behind there, okay? That's bad. That, that will really reduce, not only will it allow air to move, but it actually reduces the R value significantly, okay? So a lot of stuff like this has to happen. Uh, this is, um, uh, again, it's a slice through a wall looking down, plan view looking straight down from above, around a window, a lot of times what you'll see is architects like to put fancy treatments around windows to make the windows stand out. Um, we call those bump outs or box outs, things like that, you know, to, to give the, from the front of the house, it gives the window more interest by having the window a little bit deeper in the wall and stuff like that. So they put all this crazy framing around windows like this. Well, what's your thermal boundary? What are you going to insulate? Okay. Probably the most simple and, and easiest way to do it is just to have the interior wall be the thermal boundary and then just let these bump outs just be just be you know just add-ons so to speak okay just extra wood and extra framing and stuff like that but the problem is a lot of times this surface right here would not be in, would not have a um, air barrier across it okay so by defining this wall as your as your thermal boundary, you're saying this wall has to have sheetrock or some sort of air barrier on both sides. So the inside sheetrock is no problem. This piece of sheetrock right here is a pain. It's a lot of work to get that on there. You've got to you've got to frame it, and then you've got to figure out how this what's going to hold this sheetrock here, um, and that's 
until QII came along, that was never done. If you, you know, if they built this house and you were to drill a hole through this wall and look through here, you would see that insulation, okay? But because this is a vertical surface, it has to have, has air barriers. I'll say sheetrock, but that's the most common, but an air barrier on both sides, okay? So the other alternative is to call this your thermal boundary, but then you have to have sheetrock air barrier here and here. Okay, that's even more. Now you're insulating more, you've got more surface area. That's probably not a good way to do it, but it is allowed. It, it's okay, it will pass, but it's just a lot more work, okay, to call this. Another one, and I've actually had people do this, instead of putting sheetrock in here, they just fill this whole thing up with insulation. This whole thing is insulated. And now this is your air barrier on the inside, this is your air barrier on the outside. That would pass too. That's a whole lot more insulation, but I've actually had people do that because it's less work and cheaper than having to put this sheetrock on here and worrying about that. So a lot of little things like this. So when you look at a set of plans, look for stuff like this. Look for these weird you know, architectural bump outs and box outs around windows and say, all right, how are we gonna deal with that? How are we gonna make sure there's air barrier touching both sides of the insulation? All right, this is a big one. Another one, um, this is more along the lines of purchasing the right materials. Uh, insulation comes in different widths. We have what's called a full width bat or a bat that's designed to fit inside the framing. So if you have 16 inch on center framing, uh, some insulation is 14 and a half inches wide. So it fits inside the framing. And if you do that in an attic, what happens is you get these, these voids here. So what you want is 16 inch wide or whatever the, you know, 24 inch, whatever the framing is, so that when you put it in there, the insulation expands out over the top of the framing and touches each other. So it's a continuous, um, it's a continuous insulation. Otherwise air will just come down in here and, and you know, conducts through there. So this has a very different R value than this does here. So this is what a PERS rater will look for. Now we actually are cow certs and everyone else who has experience with QII actually kind of discourages bats in an attic. And I'll show you why in a second, but bats for raised floor and walls and stuff like that are perfectly okay. But in an attic, they can, they can cause some issues passing QII if you, if you take a strict interpretation of QII. Other things they look for, is this gap here. If they don't push the floor bat all the way up inside and it's not in contact, that's a fail. That will reduce the R value, okay? If it's not full width bats, um, these eye frame, these eye beam looking things, those are called TJIs. It's a, it's a type of manufactured framing. Um, and, and it causes some issues because it's got this little area right here that the insulation has to fill in. And so if you don't do a good job, you get these you get these voids in here and that, that reduces the R value as well, okay? So again, full width bat, properly installed and in full contact with the, the floor decking. Now, a horizontal surface does not have to have an air barrier on both sides like a wall does because a wall is a vertical surface and stratification is a vertical phenomenon. That's why we have to have um, air barriers on both sides of a wall. But on a horizontal surface, stratification is stopped by either the, the, the floor decking or the ceiling, okay? So it's not as important to have air barriers on both sides of floors and ceilings. That's why, that's why you'll see this, okay? But it does need to be well installed and it does need to be in contact with whatever the bare air barrier is, whether it's the floor decking or the ceiling on the other side, okay? Very important. So here's why we discourage bats in attics. And that is because most homes use manufactured trusses, roof trusses. And a roof truss, think of a triangle with diagonal framing coming through it. That diagonal framing interferes with insulation. And so here's the bottom, what we call the bottom cord of the roof truss. It's a two by four on edge. And then we've got a vertical truss member, those little diagonals. That's also probably gonna be a two by four. And if you take insulation and you smash it up against both sides of that framing, it doesn't allow the insulation to touch all the way. And so what happens is you get these voids and gaps in between wherever you have a vertical framing coming up through the uh, fiberglass bats, 
the bats don't touch all the way around it. And from the from the from the top looking down, it just looks like a little triangle. Oh, it's just this little gap right here. But the gap actually goes all the way down and follows all the way through. So there's a lot of places where air gets in um, and can reduce the R value. So that's why it's really difficult um, to have bats in an attic with roof trusses, okay, uh, and have it pass QII. What I have seen is where they will do, they'll do bats and then they'll blow in a, a small layer of um, uh, cellulose. They'll blow cellulose over the top of the bats and the cellulose will, will fill those gaps and, and plug those holes, okay? So that's, that's an acceptable method. Blown in insulation is probably the easiest way um, to pass the um, QII in attics when you have trusses like this. All right, so this diagram is also out of the QII handbook. And I put this together a long time ago um, as, as part of a training and it's kind of taken on a life of its own. I was just thinking, you know, who are all the people involved in a project to build a house? Who are all the people involved? And so I listed them all down the left side here. So you've got the energy consultant, you've got the builder and the architect, you've got the HERS rater, you've got the insulation installer, you've got the framer, the drywall installer, and then a whole bunch of other miscellaneous trades. You got the electrician, the plumber, um, the painter, you name it. There's a whole bunch of other miscellaneous trades that are involved. So these are all the people. And then what are all the different steps in the process of designing and building a house, okay? And this, is, this was common when I, I did a lot of production homes and we would have something called pre-design and then design and then design review. And then they were grading the, the land. Then they started framing the houses and then they would do the rough in insulation, drywall, finish, and then final inspection, okay? These go by a lot of different names and you can call them whatever you want. You can break them into smaller parts. You can combine them together, whatever. But this is a fairly, fairly typical way to describe the, the various stages of construction, okay? And this is, this is not meant to be, you know, uh, precise or anything like that. It's just to kind of give you an idea. The purpose of this diagram is to say, okay, who is involved with QII and when are they involved with QII? And I started putting, I started filling in these boxes and I was shocked how many boxes get filled in when you're talking about QII. So let's start at the beginning. So what we're talking about now is make sure this flow of information happens, okay? We're talking to energy consultants here and presumably you guys are energy consultants or, or know an energy consultant. Um, but they're the ones who check that box and roll that little snowball down the snowy hill and starts that snowball growing and growing. All right, so that starts right here. So the energy consultant checks the box and says, okay, this house needs QII. The first thing they need to do is make sure their client, whether it's the builder or the architect, knows that, is aware of that. So that's these red arrows here. So tell the builder and then ask the builder or architect, who is your HERS rater? And then the, let the HERS rater know. Now it's not, HERS raters have gotten into, you know, that's one of the first things they look at when, when someone says, here, I need you to do HERS rater on this project. They'll say, what's your CF1R? And they'll look and say, oh, QII right on top. Okay. But still it doesn't hurt to make sure the HERS rater knows that it's going to have QII. All right. <clears throat> so that's the energy consultant's job. Now where the energy consultant can really help is to help make sure that communication continues past that point. If you're the energy consultant, you say, hey, you got QII, good luck, and you hand it to them and you forget about it, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get a phone call in a few months and they're gonna say, help, help, we need some help, something happened. So it's in the energy consultant's best interest to make sure that this flow of information continues by providing them guidance, by providing them materials, by providing them resources and training as to why it's important to do this, okay? So energy consultant tells the architect and builder, hey, you've got QII. Oh, by the way, there's this really great handout. It's called the Kowser's QII Handbook. You may wanna give that to your, your insulation contractor. You make sure your insulation contractor know what's going on. Talk to your HERS rater. Ask your HERS rater what kind of advice they have what kind of, when they need to be there and, and make sure your, your HERS rater has everybody's phone number 
so they can call people to make sure it's okay to come out and inspect and stuff like that. That insulation, I'm oh, sorry, the insulation, the information needs to flow. It needs to continue to flow. It needs to get to the HERS rater. It needs to get to the insulation contractor. The builder needs to know who is doing what. The scopes of work on the project is very important. Who's sealing around the register booths? Who's sealing around the electrician? Electric, electrical uh, junction boxes and stuff like that. Who's putting that air barrier over the back of the insulation on the knee wall in the attic? It's not sheetrock, it's something else. It's a you know thermal ply or something like that. Would that be the sheetrocker? Would that be the framer? Who's gonna be responsible for that? It, it's very important that all this stuff flows, this information flows. So the HERS Raider, they're doing their thing, okay? The insulation contractor, they're doing all their thing. Look at the stuff that has to happen. They need to coordinate with the, the HERS Raider needs to coordinate with the trades. They have an ENV1, all oh, these, sorry, these are a little old. It's a 22 and 23 now. I'm uh, sorry, 21 and 22. The 23, they've been combined into two anyways. But um, all the three R's need to get done. The insulation needs to say, yes, I, I, they need to know. It's going to affect their bid. Uh, doing QII versus not doing QII can have a big impact on the insulation installer's cost. I remember back in the early days, I actually, a builder told me this. Um, they, you know, they, they discovered that a project was going to need QII. He calls up his... Um, Insulation contractor says, hey, we got this new thing. It's called QII. We're going to have to do it on our project. Um, is that going to affect the bid? And the insulation contractor goes, what is it? He says, quality insulation installation. And the, and the uh, insulation contractor says, ah, no problem. Quality is our middle name. We do it all the time. They had no idea what they were getting into. Okay. QII does affect the cost of insulation. And so they need to know that as early as possible. They need to acknowledge that, yes, QII they need to know, they need to understand the requirements. And then when they pre-insulate, they need to know that things have to be caulked and sealed and all that other good stuff. Who's doing that work is very important. The framer, the framer is responsible for most of the hard covers. When, when, the, when you've got a drop ceiling, that hard cover needs to go across the top. Usually that's OSB, if, depending on the, the span. Sometimes it needs framing to support it and things like that. So the framer needs to know about all that stuff. They need to know what is the air barrier, okay? Uh, the drywall installer needs to know all, you know, what's being sheetrocked. Is there any extra things that need to be sheetrocked that we don't normally do? Like the like the back of that wall inside the, the bump out on the front of the house around the window, that, that sheetrock on the back, that's not typical, okay? So everyone needs to know what's going on. So this flow of information is very important. I'm gonna provide you some resources, um, some information, some checklists and things like that. Um, and um, as an energy consultant, you need to emphasize that this information needs to keep flowing, okay? If you don't, here's what happens. The energy consultant says, yeah, you got QII, here you go, thanks, bye, have a great, you know, good luck on your project. Well, what happens is that information stops flowing and then the HERS rater gets out there and fails the project. They maybe they sheet rocked over the insulation and then the builder's like, oh crap, we failed. And then they call you, the energy consultant, and say, hey, we can't, we can't do this QII. We've sheetrocked over the insulation. You need to rerun the house and make it pass without QII. And these days, that is not going to happen. And now their big headache has become your big headache, and nobody's happy. So it, it pays. It's in the energy consultant's best interest to make sure that doesn't happen by ensuring that that flow of communication continues. Okay. Uh, All right. Russ, I yes. got a question. I think it was sent to me directly, but someone okay. asked, I wanted to know, what are your thoughts on air sealing with aero barrier in addition to partnering with QII insulation methods to improve the building envelope? Sure. Aero barrier is a, it's a product and um, it started off, um, Oh, what was it called? There, it started off for ducks, and I'm drawing a blank on the name. Um, it's a it's a mist, and they would blow it in the ducks. We called it we called it fix a flat for ducks, and it's a it's a mist that finds holes. And so they they expanded it from ducks, and they do something similar for a house. So imagine blowing a mist in the house. The house is pressurized, and that mist is going and finding the holes, and the mist collects where the holes in and plugs up the holes. Now. You don't want to do that in an occupied house because that mist is going to get on uh, everything, right? So you have to cover everything up. But in a aeroseal, thanks, Dave, aeroseal, 
Um, I actually helped. I actually helped test AeroSeal when it first came out. Um, it was really fascinating. We they hooked it up to a duct system, and it sealed the duct so fast. We're like, wait, we need. We didn't get to see what was going on. So we went around. We had taped over all the register boots. Uh, the house was roughed. It was roughed in. And we taped over all the register boots. So we went back and took a big nail and we poked big holes in all the tape over the register boots. And we said, okay, do it again. And so they, they turned on the aerosail machine and you can actually see the holes that the mist would, it was a, uh, it reminded me of Elmer's glue. The mist smelled like Elmer's glue, but it just got, the holes got smaller and smaller and smaller and they, they sealed up. And then you see the pressure rise up and the houses, the ducts were tight. So the, it's the same concept, but now they're doing it to the entire house. It'll seal a pretty significant gap. Um, and so I think it's a pretty cool product, but it, it's very, um, you can only do it at a certain time. You have to do it, you know, before the house is painted, before the carpet goes in and stuff like that. I check with them and see, but I, I think it's a really cool product. Um, I, I, would, I would certainly recommend it. Um, it's a lot of times, it's used because they can't pass something like they'll, if they take extra credit for the house being extra tight, you know, the, the default is uh, five ACH 50 or five, five ACH 50 is the default um, uh, for, for a standard house, but you can choose uh, a tight, say model a house tighter, say, I'm going to build my house extra tight. I want extra credit for that. And then you have to do the blower door test to prove that that's the case. Well, if you can't pass the blower door test and you've gone around and you've, you've looked at everything, um, you can come in afterwards with aero seal. Well, that's, that was for ducts, um, but the air barrier for the house and do it like that. So a lot of times it's done as sort of, well, we can't, it's kind of an emergency, we need it. Um, but they're starting to market it for, um, you know, as, as sort of standard practice on, on some new homes. So I think it's pretty cool actually. Um, all right, let's see. So here's some tips for builders. So energy consultants, these are tips to give your builder to help that flow communicate. So if the project needs QII, and the first place to look is right on the CF1R and highlight it, it's right there at the top, it's pretty obvious. So look at the plans, look at the plans, lay the plans out, go through, follow the walls, look for any weird places that you're gonna have to add an air barrier. And one real common one is, I mentioned before those um, uh, fiberglass inserts for tub and showers, when they're being slipped in up against a exterior wall, usually they just do it right over the insulation. Uh, that's not going to work. That's not an air barrier. Okay, it's got to have it's got to have sheetrock or something behind it. So things like that. So so look for knee walls. That's a a knee wall is any wall where if you drill a hole through it from inside the house, you're going to come out in the attic. Okay, when you have vaulted ceilings, things like that, uh, you have knee walls the back side of that knee wall has to have sheetrock or an air barrier on it, okay? Who's gonna do that? Um, hard covers when you have different ceiling heights, okay? Uh, bump outs around windows, fireplaces. Fireplaces, um, you know, most fireplaces are just these metal and glass inserts that, that you can't even get to them anymore. Uh, they're just purely decorative. Um, a lot of times the outside wall will bump out around the fireplace. So that makes it look like a real wood burning fireplace. That becomes a real problem. What is the air barrier? You have to decide what is the thermal boundary. So decide exactly where the thermal boundary will be. Precisely define responsibilities. I can't emphasize that enough. I've just seen too many times where uh, a project fails QII and no one knows who was supposed to do that. No one, why did it fail? Because no one knows they were, they were supposed to do that. So the, um, uh, HERS readers have checklists in the QII handbook. There's some checklists. The forms themselves are really useful uh, checklists, okay? The builder should take the CF2R, um, ENB 22, 21 and 22 and scan through it and say, okay, who's gonna do this? Who's gonna do this? Who's gonna do this? Who's gonna do this? And actually put it in their contract. Say line such and such from the CF2R is your responsibility put that in their contract, okay? Make sure they know who's doing what. Then the builders, HERS Raiders, part of a HERS Raiders job has evolved into being a trainer, okay? HERS Raiders don't wanna fail stuff. They want people to pass. And so HERS Raiders have no problems giving advice to help people pass ahead of time. So contact the HERS Raiders, say, hey, 
what do I need to do? The Hearst Raider, it would, if, you, if they have good experience, they'll say, oh, you know, this last project on, it was a nightmare because they forgot to do this, this, and this. Don't forget to do that. You know, they'll give you good advice. A lot of Hearst Raiders have access to checklists and lots of informational materials. Um, meet the Hearst Raider out at the project and walk through the project with the Hearst Raider. Say, have the Hearst Raider point out stuff where that's been problems in the past. Make sure you get a hardcover on this. Where your ducks are coming down chases, make sure you put a, a draft stop around those and seal around that the ducks and things like that. Um, and then builders, learn to use the CalSearch registry. If you need to, the Raider can train you on how to use the CalSearch registry, but it's very important that those forms get filled out on the registry, sign on the registry, and you get all green dots on your forms, okay? Very important. All right, here's the CalSearch handbook. Um, it used to be if you just went to the CalSearch.com website, there was a resources button, and you could click on that button and it would drop down and you would see the QII handbook there. I went this morning to find that and I couldn't find it, but I Googled 2022 CalSearch QII handbook and it popped up just fine. It was the very first thing on the list. It's a PDF. It's about 116 pages uh, and it's free. Okay. Um, it's something I put together a long time ago and it's evolved over the years. Now I think Roy Mitleider does most of the stuff to it, but it's a really, really useful document. It basically takes the protocols, which is RA 3.5. If you go to the reference appendix section 3.5, there's almost no pictures in there at all. It's just words, okay? It's the standards for what you're supposed to do, okay? Well, we took that and we added pictures and we added explanation, and we added diagrams, and we added all this stuff um, to make this really useful handbook. A lot of people use this handbook. It's really, um, it's really useful it's, it, and it's well done. Um, it's been updated for 2022. Not a whole lot of changes for 2022. It's a free download. You can download it, you can email it to builders, you can email it to stuff, different contractors and stuff like that. Um, I heard rumors that they were working on a Spanish language version of it. Um, check with CalSearch to see if that's true. Um, um, that could be useful. All right, um, so here's what's in it. Uh, they spend a lot of time talking about draft stops. That's very important. A lot of good pictures, oops, a lot of good pictures. Um, you know, the ducks going up through chases. You want to seal around the ducts. You can see the ceiling here. We've got examples of good jobs, examples of bad jobs. Make the ceiling as flat as possible. Prevent insulation from falling into voids. Uh, prevent airflow from coming up through the house. Okay, that's what draft stops are all about. Defining your air barrier. I mentioned that, very important. Um, here's a diagram showing a, a tub insert. If this or a shower insert, if you slide this fiberglass shower insert in and there's no air barrier in front of the insulation, now that becomes the air barrier. And that's not a good air barrier. Okay, that fiberglass tub or shower uh, does not make a good air barrier because it's just not designed for that. So you need that air barrier to come straight down behind it. So look, look for any places that a tub or shower is up against an exterior wall and and Make sure there's a note on the plans to say sheetrock, air bearer between here and the tub. Um, if you are, if um, a big thing now is, is uh, encapsulated attics. If you encapsulate an attic, now your air barrier is up on the, on the top, okay? Um, on the roof deck and so on, instead of the ceiling. Now that's an encapsulated attic, not a, not a high performance attic. I'll, I'll explain the difference here in a second. Um, occasionally you'll run into houses that have encapsulated crawl spaces. Now the air barrier follows the foundation wall and goes across the top of the, the, the crawl space floor, which is earth, okay? So you need, you need um, um, plastic or something creating the air barrier there. So define your air barrier, very, very important. Um, SPF, spray on polyurethane foam. Great stuff if, 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 if used correctly. Um, I've heard horror stories about it. I've heard great things about it. The, the, the key is uh, use the right product and use the right installer. Uh, but the thing about it is it is an insulator and an air sealer all in one, which is great, which is really good. Um, so you are allowed to have a certain amount of voids in the wall. So remember I said it's very important that when you put the, put the sheetrock on that the sheetrock is touching the insulation, that does not necessarily apply to SPF. So you can 
have voids as long as you've got the right thickness around the edges. So each type of, of spray on polyurethane foam, there's two basic types, there's open cell and closed cell, okay? Have certain thicknesses that they have to meet in order to be considered an air barrier. And for closed cell, it's two inches and, and open cell, it's five and a half inches, okay? Um, let's see, I just saw a question. What suggestions I have to minimize volatile organic compounds such as ceiling is being done in these buildings? I don't have any advice on that, unfortunately. Um, that's what I mentioned in horror stories. Um, so um, that's a different issue. That is ventilation, all right? That's all about ventilation. Um, the um, VOCs are gonna come from a lot of different things. If you're using spray and polyurethane foam, it does off gas. Some, some products off gas much worse than others. And so that was what I was saying. If you don't, if they don't use the right product and if they don't uh, have a proper mix and a proper installation, it'll off gas a lot more. That was the horror stories I heard. Some, some guy hired a, a contractor installing it for the very first time, sprayed it on, did a horrible job and the house was unusable. They had to rip, they had to tear out all the spray on foam. So, um, but, as, but VOCs come from other things as well. They come from carpets, um, uh, wood products, you know, stuff inside your house. That's all in ventilation. That is ASHRAE 62 point ample ventilation. Uh, we're making this really, really tight, which is a good thing, but then we're pumping outside air into it. And it was like, why are we going to all this trouble to make a house super tight and then blowing air into it or blowing air out of it? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it does when you remember it's all about control. It's all about having precise control over that ventilation using it when you want it and stopping it when you don't and making sure that it's happening all the time. Back in the old day, we used to just open a window, all right? Well, how do you control that? And what if it's windy? What if it's not windy? What do you do? How do you know how much, how much air changes are happening? Is it enough? Is it too much? Okay, so that's all about ventilation. Yep, mechanical ventilation, hash rate 62.2. All right, um, so you can have some voids in spray and polyurethane foam depending on the type of insulation. Okay, whether it's open cell or closed cell. So, but you gotta have the thicknesses around the edges in order for it to be considered a um, air barrier. Um, attic venting is a big thing. It's, it's kind of a personal pet peeve of mine. Uh, attic venting, how much attic vents. You, if you're familiar um, with the building code, it says there's what we call the one to 150, one to 300 rule. So for every square foot of attic, you have to have 150, uh, for every 150 square foot of attic, you have to have one square foot of net free vent area. Um, if you do, um, if you do uh, only low, if you do high low, it's one to 300, et cetera, et cetera. That amount of, ins of, of um, ventilation in an attic is not adequate. That is code minimum. And it's, it's based on something entirely different than what we want it for. We want ventilation to get heat out of our attics, okay? especially if you have your ducts up there. Um, so we've started encouraging the use of radiant barriers and now the super duper radiant barrier, which is putting insulation under the roof deck, even if it's a vented attic. So attic venting is super important. Remember I said, remember I said blown in insulation doesn't stop air, except when you don't want it to stop air. It does a really good job of stopping air from coming into your attics if you blow it over your vents. That's why it's very important that your vents, your attic vents be baffled. And that's something that HERS raters will look for to make sure that, that whatever kind of vent is allowing the attic air to, to come through, that the insulation doesn't cover it. Those old fashioned bird blocks, you've seen those round holes drilled in the, in the, in, in the under the eaves. Those are horrible. Those are horrible. I've seen insulation blown over the top of them. The spider webs will cover them and then the dust will cover them and then they just, they, they plug up. Um, Back in, I, I've seen houses that were extremely uncomfortable in the summertime because their attic vents got, got covered up. So it's, it's, a, it's something I'm kind of a stickler about, um, but um, we can talk about that all day. So baffling insulation, very important. That's something HERS raters check for. The type of can lights that you have in your house is important. You want those to be, you want those to be IC and AT rated. Um, can lights are just a hole in your sheetrock. And if you, if you live in an older house that has can lights in it, 
I guarantee you air is just gushing through those can lights, okay? Uh, it's not good. One way to fix old, old can lights is to put up, they, they make these styrofoam igloos that go over the top of them. Your best bet is to replace them. Replace them with an IC or AT rated can light. Very big source of leakage. Um, some weird framing stuff. Um, it, depending on how they frame the house, it can create these exterior channels that if they put the siding over before they insulate it, at the fail, that becomes just a channel for air to pass through. So um, there's new alternative framing techniques that allow these to be um, accessible from the inside. A lot of builders are going to that, that's important. Uh, these big, huge tubs, like this is spa tubs, jacuzzi tubs up against an exterior wall. You want an air barrier all along underneath there. There needs to be an air barrier behind the tub if that's an exterior wall, okay? So those are big deals. Lots of good photos. Uh, knee walls and skylight shafts, okay? Uh, because it is considered a vertical surface, it needs air barrier on both sides. So inside sheetrock, no problem, they'll do that. It's this outside, the attic side, who's putting on that air barrier, whether it's sheetrock or thermoply or OSB or whatever, who's putting that on there, okay? Very important, that's, that's a big deal. Not something that they didn't do for many, many years until QII came around. Uh, probably my least part, my least favorite topic of QII is window and door headers. I think it, it's very unfortunate. This causes a lot of projects to fail. And in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small detail, but it is enough to cause things to fail. Um, QII, window and door headers. If you're not putting um, rigid foam on the outside of the house, a lot of houses do, and that's fine. And then, then you're, you're, that's considered your your um, header insulation, okay? If you're, if you're putting a rigid foam on the outside of the studs, that will excuse you from having to insulate the header separately. So, but if you're not putting rigid insulation on the outside, then you've got to put special insulation on window and door headers, and it's a real pain in the butt, okay? So very, very important. Energy consultants, tell your builders, how are you doing your headers? Make sure you, you plant that, that bug in their ear and, and they start talking to people say, how are we doing our headers? I don't want this to cause our house to fail, okay? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a pain, all right? So insulation, insulating headers is a part of QIR. Um, unvented encapsulated attics. Um, this area is, is not exactly considered condition space by, by the code. Um, it's within the thermal boundary. Um, but it's not considered directly conditioned space, okay? But um, if you are encapsulating your attic, it's an unvented attic, you got to know where your thermal boundary is now. This gable end on the end, that is now a vertical surface, and it now needs to have sheetrock over it, okay? So it needs to have an air barrier over it. Um, this right here would not pass QII. This is actually a house in Las Vegas. I thought this was interesting. They, they, the way they put their insulation on their roof deck uh, in their attics was they, they hung this fabric and then they blew it in and it, it looked like a padded room. It looked like a, um, an upholstered attic. Um, you can see the holes where they blew it in, okay? But because there's no air barrier on this vertical surface, it wouldn't pass QII. It needs to have an air barrier on both sides. All right. In the CalCERT's handbook, at the very, very end of the handbook, there are some checklists. They, we took the ENV 21 and 22 and converted that into a checklist. It's very useful. There's also another very useful document in there called how to read the insulation requirements of a CF1R PERF-01. If you're familiar with CF1R PERF-01s, it can be 12, 13, 14 pages of just numbers and tables. And it's like the most boring thing in the world. And it's very difficult to read for a new person. If you hand one of these to a person who's never seen a CF1R Perf01, they're gonna go, what in the world? What does this mean? What does that mean? What is it? Why is there walls over here? And then there's walls over here. Why is the attic here? Why is the windows do like, this doesn't make any sense. They're really hard to read. So this is a tool, this is a resource. It's, I think it's still one page how to read the insulation requirements of the CF1R. It tells you where to look in the CF1R for the insulation contractor to know exactly what needs to be done, okay? Um, what's the R value of certain surfaces, um, you know, things like that. So that's a really useful tool too.
Um, one kind of oddball thing is as an energy consultant, you there's another little checkbox you can check um, for spray on polyurethane foam. Um, there's default R values per inch for SPF. Okay. Um, I forget what those numbers are, but um, some R value per inch. Okay. And then you know how thick it's going to be and you just use those default numbers. But some manufacturers of SPF products have better R value per inches. And you can choose, excuse me, you can choose to use that number when you model the house. If you do, if you check that box and you say, I'm going to use a non-standard R value per inch on my SPF, it triggers an extra HERS inspection on that SPF, okay? It's a subset of QII. If QII is already on the house, and it probably is, it's not a big deal. But if you check that box and the house doesn't have QII, it causes issues. <laughs> it causes issues. It triggers some QII forms that aren't otherwise triggered. So I don't know if the if the HERS registries have, have accounted for this yet, but I would say the vast majority of homes are going to have QII, so it's not an issue. But just be aware. If you check that non-standard SPF and the house doesn't have QII, there's gonna be some weird issues with what forms to be filled out, okay? They may have, they may have resolved this issue. Uh, I haven't checked in the last few months, um, but um, anyways, just so you know. That is it. We're a little bit early. Um, happy to uh, open the lines for questions. Um, I know Gray had a couple more announcements that she wanted to make um, about um, future classes, upcoming classes and things like that. Yeah, barring any other questions, um, I just wanted to show y'all some of the classes that we have upcoming. Uh, Russ, if you don't mind, I'm gonna sure. steal the screen here. Absolutely. Um, so this year, most of you are probably familiar is 3C Ren's calendar of events. And so here we are today. Uh, up next, if you know any plumbers, we're doing an information session on our new gas water heater loaner program, which helps customers to temporarily replace their gas water heater on burnout uh, while heat pump upgrades are done in the interim. Um, so that they don't have any disruption in service, but they are still able to upgrade their unit. Uh, other courses that we have are passive house windows. We have our accredited green appraiser training on August 22nd and 23rd. And then we're also starting a home electrification planning series. Um, it's three parts on August 22nd, August 29th, and September 5th. Uh, and it'll cover everything you need to know about creating a home electrification plan for homeowners and contractors. Um, and then last up this month is our zero net carbon design series is kicking off with the reducing embodied carbon course. So 3cren.org backslash events, and you can register for any of these classes. Good stuff. All right, folks, I think that's it. We can give you all a few extra minutes back in your day and we will be sending the follow-up slides and details. Oh, it looks like we do have a question in the chat if you wanna take that, Russ. Yeah, let's see. In existing home with attic that has fiberglass bat above second story ceilings, what helps most to improve upon that? I reflect it under a roof, um, blowing in cellulose, replace bats. The best thing you can do is seal first. Um, unfortunately, sometimes that requires removing all the insulation and then sealing, sealing the ceiling. If that makes sense. S E A L I N G, sealing the ceiling, C E I L I N G. Um, seal your ceiling barrier. Okay, sealing the ceiling. Um, that's probably the most important thing because, like I said, um, if you have holes in your ceiling, if you have old can lights, if you have light fixtures, ceiling fans, smoke detectors, any penetration in your ceiling, air is going to move up through there. 
and that air is going to go right through that insulation and come out. No matter how thick that insulation is, no matter how deep it is, air is going to come right out. So the first and best thing you can do is, is air seal first, okay? But like I said, that can be expensive because sometimes you have to remove the existing insulation and then replace the insulation. Um, after that, um, adding more insulation is a good thing. Um, and then if your ducts are in the attic, one of the things you want to be careful about is, is um, get your attic getting really hot. And I was talking about attic ventilation and things like that. Um, there's the new prescriptive requirement that's been around, actually been around a, at least one code cycle is called high performance attics. And that is putting insulation under the roof deck of the attic, okay, as well as on the ceiling but it's a vented attic. So you've got moving air moving in between the ceiling insulation and the, and the roof deck insulation. So when I first saw that, I was like, why do that? What good is that ceiling insulation? And what it is, is think of it as a super duper radiant barrier. So you know what radiant barrier is, that's that silver, I think you call it reflectix. Uh, it's that silver material. So the sun hits the roof, that heat wants to radiate into the attic and the, the radiant barrier stops that radiation from coming through. But that surface still gets hot and conduction can happen. So, so even better than radiant barriers, just put insulation up under there. And that stops the radiant heat and the conductive heat. So it's purely about keeping that solar energy out of your attic so your attic stays cool. That's very important if your ducts are up there and if you're in a really hot cooling dominated climate. If you're out on the coast, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so that's the other thing. And then uh, George mentioned attic fans. Uh, it depends, it depends. I'm not a big fan of the big attic fans, those big, huge ones that you buy at Home Depot and they shake your house when they run. You know, those will create a negative pressure in your attic because chances are you don't have enough attic ventilation, passive ventilation. And when you put this big attic fan in there, it's either pushing air in, usually they, they blow air out of the attic. It's creating a very high negative pressure that's going to pull air out of your house. Okay. It'll make your attic cool because, it, because it's pulling cold air out of your house up into your attic. Um, so, um, I, I'm a fan of the smaller, lower powered solar attic fans, put several of those on your roof. They run off the sun. So there's no power, power consumption to worry about. They run on a lower fan speed. And what they do is they start the air moving and it, and it allows the air to then use its normal convective patterns. And that does a better job. Okay. Um, so yeah, keep your attics cool. Um, it, it all depends on how well sealed your attics are and whether you have enough add, if you can add more attic venting, that, that helps to passive vents. Okay. Um, let's see what we got in here. Attic fan, no longer use old registers, placing, um, force air heating with ductless. Yeah. Get your ducts out of the attic. Yeah. Uh, ducts are, ducts are responsible for a lot of energy use. Um, and if you can get rid of your ducts or move your ducts inside conditioned space, that has a big impact. Um, ductless mini splits are great. Um, the problem I have with ductless mini splits is you can't put one in every single room and they will heat and cool the room that they're in really well. But like if I put one in my office, is it gonna heat and cool that bathroom over there? I don't know, I probably not. It depends on how well sealed your house is and if there's any air movement and things like that. So. Ductless, ductless have their place, um, but I'm, I'm a fan of ducted systems, but get all your ducts inside conditioned space so you don't have that, that stuff. No. How do we ensure no moisture accumulation between the top of insulation and the bottom of the roof? Ah, interesting question. <clears throat> there was a um, presentation at the Dry Climate Home Performance Conference, um, and they're finding that for some reason, insulation is, is accumulating at the roof peak when you have insulation under the roof deck. That, that top six or eight inches where all the insulation comes up and they're pulling the insulation back and they're finding evidence of moisture up there. Um, I think ventilation, for one thing, make sure your attic is properly ventilated. Um, and then I don't know if they ever really had solved that issue. They couldn't figure out why it was happening. It has to do with dew point. Um, which has to do with temperature and relative humidity and the moisture reaching dew point and condensing. Why is it doing it at the roof deck and stuff like that? Um, I'd have to read up on that to, to answer that question really well. Uh, it's really interesting. I'm starting to do a lot of work with contractors in other states like Florida, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia. 
uh, <clears throat> where it's super humid and humidity is, is a big issue. It makes things so much more complicated. Uh, so there's a lot to learn about psychrometrics and, and, and uh, moisture control and stuff like that. So sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Um, what is the best thing to do about losses through slab on grade? Great question. Insulate the slab edge. Just put some rigid foam board on that slab edge. It's funny that, um, you know, up until very recently, 95% of homes had gas furnaces in it. And when you do your cooling load calc, you size your air conditioner, you're going to put a gas furnace on there to provide enough air for your air conditioner. Nine out of 10 times, that furnace is way oversized and the, for, for the heating load. And so as a result, we just never paid attention to heating load in California. We were always focused on cooling load, sizing, cooling, and stuff like that. As long as it passed Title 24, we were okay. But now we're starting to go back and really look at heating load because now we're starting to look at heat pumps. And you start looking at heating load and something that jumps out at you when you look at your heat load calculations is the, the heat load due to the slab. It's huge. It's gigantic. And so all you have to do is put slab edge insulation. You can retrofit that. Uh, you have to dig out around the slab and you just put um, this rigid foam board. But if you're building the house, it's, it's, it's easy. When they form the slab, they put a rigid foam insulation inside the form. They pour the slab. They can also put it under the slab on the edges because the, the, uh, the heat will actually go through the floor and out the side. But most of it escapes around the edge of the slab. Um, but anyways, they just pour the concrete and they take the foam boards away and the, the rigid foam board stays in place. There's even a product that actually acts as the foam board. You pour the insulation and you just leave it there and it, and it insulates the slab. So yeah, rigid insulation at the, at the edge of slab. Uh, what do you put on top of insulation? Concrete cap with expansion joint. Um, there are some products, they're primarily, they're primarily intended for air sealing. There's a... Um, um, there's a little foam, three and a half inch wide foam thing that they roll out. And when they stand the walls up, it, it sits on top of that. Um, you don't want anything inside the house because then it affects, you know, your carpeting and your flooring and stuff like that. Um, so there's not much you can do on top of the slab except to insulate that slab edge. Yeah, that's about the best. Yeah. Um, all right. Concrete cap with expansion joint. Yeah, there's there's three or four different ways to insulate slab edges. You can go horizontal, you go vertical, um, and and stuff like that. Um, trying to remember where I saw that. I think in the um, residential compliance manual, I think it talks about slab on grade insulation and different ways to do it and how to model it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks all. Thanks for the great questions, George. Well, we'll wrap up for today and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much for joining us.